Good afternoon, and welcome to the Combined South Okanagan Annual Ceremonial Review for 788 BC Dragoons Royal Canadian Army Cadets, 259 Panther Squadron Royal Canadian Air Cadets, 902 Nighthawk Squadron Royal Canadian Air Cadets, and 232 Bighorn Squadron Royal Canadian Air Cadets. I am Flight Corporal Sidorachuk. Number. And I am Warren Officer Second Class for T. Bakshi. Number one, right, remainder. A, a brief history on 788 BC Dragoons Royal Canadian Army Cadet Corps. 788 was originally formed on the 4th of July 1919 as the Cadet Corps was disbanded on October 14th, 1925. The Corps reformed in 1940 and disbanded on the 3rd of December 1947 in in October 1962, C Company of the 9th Reese Regiment Cadet Corps was redesigned as the 788 B the British Columbia Dragoons Cadet Corps Pendleton. The current commanding chair is Captain Stephen Brown and Mr. Ken Usher is the sponsoring committee chair. The corps' current strength is 9 cadets strong. A brief history on 259 Panther Royal Canadian Air Cadets. 259 Panther Squadron was formed in February 1943 under the command of Lieutenant Claude Bell. The squadron operated at Penticton High School until the end of World War II. Around 1947, the squadron was inactive due to lack of quarters, eventually moving into the new built armories located on Nanaimo Ave. 1951 saw the squadron reactivated under the command of retired Flight, flight Lieutenant Tony Day. The current commanding officer is Captain Katinka Guzin and Mr. Troy Fader Romeo is the current sponsoring committee chair. The squadron's current strength is 42 cadets strong. Now, we move on to a brief history of the 902 Nighthawk Royal Canadian Air Cadet Squadron. The 902 Nighthawk was the 48th squadron formed in British Columbia. It stood up in 1990 and received its charter in 1991. Originally named the 902 Kiwanis Royal Canadian Air Cadet Squadron, reflective of the sponsorship and support provided by the Kiwanis Club at the time. In 2015, the squadron saw and received approval for a name change to 902 Nighthawk Squadron. This also marked the beginning of a relationship with the RCAF Nighthawk 409 Squadron in Cold Lake, Alberta. The current commanding officer is Captain Stephen Brown, and Mrs. Adele Meadow is the sponsoring committee chair. The squadron's current strength is 32 cadets strong. And finally, a brief history of the 232 Bighorn Royal Canadian Air Cadet Squadron. The 232 Squadron first received its charter from the Air Cadet League of Canada on December 11, 1942, at the time called the 232 OTS Squadron. The name reflected the three areas that it combined, which was Oliver, Testalinda, and Soyuz. After several sporadic operating years, the squadron was issued a second charter in 1949 with the name changed to 232 Rattler Squadron. In 1985, at the request of the cadets, the squadron's name was changed to 232 Bighorn Squadron. 232 is loaded, located in Oliver, BC by the airport. The current commanding officer is Captain Amy Nectel and Mr. Michael Caccioni is the sponsoring committee's chair. The squadron's current strength is 34 cadets strong. Our biography of Miss, Mrs. C Susan Midgley, lead rec League Representative, Air Cadet League of Canada, British Columbia Provincial Committee. Born in Montreal, Quebec, and moved to Vancouver in 1949, she followed her in her mother's footsteps to become a volunteer for two 232 in 2008 when her foster son joined the squadron. From 2009 to 2016, she chaired a 232 Bighorn Squadron. She received the Certificate of Honor in 2013. In, 26, in 2018, she joined the League as League Representative for 259 and returned to 232 as League Representative in 2019. Susan has three daughters and one out of five grandchildren has joined 232.
Number two, flight markers. Triple four. Steady. Stay on down. Center, right, steady. Number one, flight, rear, marker, triple back. Number one, flight, rear, marker, triple back. Steady, stay on down. Number three, flight, rear, marker, triple four. Steady, stay on down. Number three, cadet. Number one, flight. Triple four. Steady. Number four, flight. Rear, marker. Triple four. Steady. Stay on down. Rear, right, steady. Parade, steady.
please rise for the rising of the flags. Cadet Support Unit, Pacific Commander Paula McHale. A past sea cadet from Nanaimo, BC, Commander Paula McHale enrolled in the Canadian Armed Forces in 1993 as a cadet instructor quadri officer in Edmonton, Alberta. She completed a Bachelor of Arts at the University of Alberta in 1998. In 2001, she transferred into the regular force as a Naval Warfare Officer. Upon completion of her training at the Naval Officer Training Center Venture, she was posted to the HMCS Vancouver and later HMCS Algonquin, where she attained her Naval Officer Professional Qualifications during RIMPAC 2004 in Hawaii. In 2005, she completed her Fleet Navigating Officer course and was subsequently posted to the HMCS Calgary as the ship's navigating officer. While serving in this position, she was extremely fortunate to visit many West Coast ports, thoroughly explore the north coast of BC, sail in the Canadian Coast Guard ship Sir Wilfrid Laurier in the Western Arctic and the HMAS Menorah for the RIMPAC 2006. In 2008, she remained in the HMCS Calgary, resumed the duties of a deck officer, and deployed for the OP Altair off the Horn of Africa. She then circumnavigated the globe while transitioning to and from the theater of operations. Commander McHale returned to the Naval Officer Training Center venture in 2009 as an instructor. In 2010, she was posted to the Canadian Forces Recruiting Centre, or CRFC, for the Detachment Victoria as a military career counsellor. And in 2013, she assumed the duties of Detachment Commander. In 2016, she was posted to Director of Military Careers II in Ottawa as coordinator for the Royal Canadian Navy Career Managers. She assumed the command of CRFC Northern and Eastern Ontario in June of 2017, responsible for detachments Ottawa, Kingston, and Sudbury. Upon relinquishing rel command, she remained with the Canadian Forces Recruiting Group in liaison, officer capacity, and embedded in the Military Personnel Generation Group in Ottawa until 2021. She was then posted to the Naval Personnel Training Group, HQ, and employed as the Venture Division Commander at the Naval Fleet School Pacific. She was promoted to her present rank in July 2022 and is married with two daughters.
understand. Please be seated while the inspecting party inspects the squadron. The inspecting the, inspe the inspecting party today includes reviewing officer, Regional Cadet Support Unit, Pacific Commanding Officer, Commander Paula McHale, Special Guest, Commanding Officer 409 Tactical Fighter Squadron, RCAF Lieutenant Gerlin, Colonel Corey Mass, Air Cadet League Representative, Mrs. Student Midgley, League Representative of the Air Cadet League of Canada, Legion Representative President Jim DeMars, Captain Stephen Brown, Commanding Officer of the 788 RCACC and 902 RCACS, Captain Kentinka Gusin, Commanding Officer of the 259 RCACS, Captain Amy Nechtel, Commanding Officer of 232 RCACS, Parade Commander, Air Cadet Warrant Officer First Class Connor Mackey, Flight Commanders, Flight Sergeant Jake Riley, Flight Sergeant Johnny Berard, Flight Sergeant Sam Franson, Warrant Officer Gabriel Maskey, There are also dignitaries who will be joining today. 
There is from Legion Branch 97, Dale and Carol Young. From Legion Branch 40, Ron Bannister, Cadet Liaison. Legion Branch 227, Bill Jennings. And from the Penticton City Council representatives, Councillors Graham and Gilbert. The squadrons will be performing demonstrations. Today's demonstrations will include effective speaking presentation by myself, Flight Corporal Sidorchuk, from 259 Panther RC ACS, and 232, 232 Bighorn Squadron will be presenting a first aid demonstration. Well, while the corps and squadrons are dismissed to prepare for demonstrations, I would like to acknowledge the generous, the generous support provided by the Department of National Defenses and the Government of Canada for corps and squadron training, uniforms, and summer camps transportation. I would also like to acknowledge the support of the Army and Air Cadet Leagues of Canada. The Army and Air Cadet Leagues of Canada foster development program in youth, the values of self-confidence, self-discipline, and leadership and physical fitness. The leagues also provide a voice in Canada for Army and Air Cadet movement as a whole, so that Canadian public are aware of its accomplished capabilities of the cadet movement and, our, and the ability to fulfill its aims. In addition, the, the Department of National Defenses and the Air Cadet League of Canada provide assist, assistance in providing na national summer training courses such as power, power pilot's license, glider pilot's license, and international air cadet exchange or airport operations and many more. An element in Air Cadets says, supported by the Air Cadet League of Canada is effective speaking program. Myself, Flight Corporal Keaton Sidorchuk from 259 Penticton RC ACS will be speaking on why cadets have been a personal, a good, has been good for my personal growth. First, I would like to thank the, undi the undeniable leadership, encouragement, and support we have received from our officers at my home squadron, the 259 Panthers. Throughout my time in the program, I've earned the rank of Flight Corporal. Personally, I recommend this program to all of those who are between the age of 12 and 19. I'd like to take a few moments to discuss how being a part of the Air Cadet program has helped build, pursue my interests and is helping me give back to the community and aiding to build its strength. As many of you are aware, the 259 Panther Squadron was established in 1943 under the command of Lieutenant Claude Bell. Since then, the program has evolved to become comprehensive youth development that emphasizes leadership, citizenship, and physical fitness. I would like to share a little bit about myself to demonstrate how powerful, the, how powerful impact the Air Cadet program has made on my personal life and how it has driven my leadership and citizenship skills. Prior to joining cadets, I was lost. I was struggling with mental health issues like depression, anxiety, and low self-esteem. While these are common struggles for adolescent kids, as we navigate through these huge transition periods, I was not okay. I didn't know who to reach out to, and I was scared of sharing my struggles with my parents as not to worry them, and I didn't have much support through school. I was the classic big guy, nerdy type who didn't have a big circle of friends and next to no confidence. Being as tall as I am, I often stuck out like a sore thumb which is the last thing I wanted to draw more attention to myself. I became very good at pretending to be okay. Before I knew it, I was spiraling down a deep hole of depression. 
I built up the courage to talk to my parents, who led me to a doctor who diagnosed me with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, otherwise known as ADHD. What I didn't know is that my depression and anxiety were very common conditions that come with ADHD. My uncle, who's a recreational pilot, is one of the, is one of the many people who suggested trying the Air Cadet program. We have a long line of family members who are part of the Royal Canadian Air Force, and as he suggested, this might help me find some purpose from being outside of being a teenager. Boy, was he right. I didn't expect to enjoy the program as much as I did, nor did I expect to acquire lifelong skills and figure out what kind of person I want to be when I enter adulthood in a couple years. Since day one of the cadet program, I felt a sense of connectedness and community. I felt respected and valuable. I was a member of something I belonged. I noticed a change in how I presented myself in my everyday life. I was no longer, to tr I was no longer trying to hide. Rather, I was standing tall and develop developing leadership skills in school, at home, and in our community. Because of the profound impact this program has made on me, I have have had the pleasure of volunteering at various community-based events through the cadet program, but I've also volunteered outside of the cadet program, keeping the same values of service, leadership, and citizenship in my everyday life. To say the Air Cadet program merely influenced me to be a leadership a leader is an understatement. It showed, me, it showed me the potential I could have to make an impact on everyone around me. Being diagnosed with ADHD, depression, and anxiety is no longer something I, that can hold me back from achieving greatness. And I have, this, I have the Air Cadet program to thank for that. Good citizenship involves attitude, behaviors that reinforce ties to the community. Examples of these behaviors include obeying laws, being friendly to other members of the community, and helping maintain cleanliness and order of the surroundings. This also includes volunteering in the local community and developing an interest in local, national, and international issues, as well as contributing for recognition with Indigenous peoples. The Air Cadet program continues to instill a sense of pride, respect, and duty in young Canadians like myself, and helps guide those who are, who are ready to assume their places as tomorrow's leaders and decision makers. By the end of my first year with cadets, I have received several awards with school, including the, Lord, uh, including the Clara Jack Memorial Award, thriving in the school community, leadership and responsibility, perseverance and passion, teacher support, yearbook, culture, heritage, positive attitude, and being caring and empathetic. I also won a service award for organizing students' events, uh, volunteering for leadership opportunities, mentoring younger students, assisting teachers with technology and support. I also had the privilege of accepting Top Level 2 Cadet Award in 2022. I hope you guys will all join me in continuing to support the Air Cadets program and its important mission. First aid is a very useful skill to have, and it can save lives, especially in a survival situation. In cadets, learning first aid prepares you to think critically and quickly. This skill can carry on past first aid and be used in everyday life. The 232 Squadron is incredibly honored to present their own scenario of first aid being used to save lives after a severe situation, such as an earthquake. Please welcome Cadet Bakshi, Cadet Gupta, LAC Dortman, Corporal Monk, Corporal Samard, Corporal Webb, Sergeant Pedersen, Flight Sergeant Hunker, and Flight Sergeant Samard, as well as Warrant Officer Second Class Bakshi, as they show you what to do in a first aid scenario after an earthquake. Attention, attention. Earthquake incoming, please find shelter. With the annual ACR, we have our dynamic display. This year, it is first aid after an earthquake. We have a casualty with an injury to their abdomen. The first aid team is now assessing to assure it is safe for the team to assist the casualty, looking for open wires, tripping hazards, and other dangers. They will introduce themselves and ensure the casualty has an intact airway, is breathing, and have complete circulation. They will now assess a 30-second head-to-toe to find any fatal injuries.
They have found the extent of the injury to the abdomen and will need to act quick with first aid supplies. Disembowelment or the event of intestines falling out of the abdomen. Since the intestines have no damage, the two priorities for the team is to limit shock and to ensure the organs have a simulated environment. The team will wrap the intestines in wet, warm cloth to ensure the intestines don't dry and lose their tissue. Next, they will cover the open wound site with bandage to limit shock. Shock is a condition that has the potential to be life-threatening and in most cases is. It is a condition that is caused by lack of circulation. Common injuries that cause shock are severe allergic reactions, blood loss, dehydration, and severe infection. One of the most common symptoms of shock is low blood pressure, although other symptoms are changes in consciousness, cold, and clammy skin. Now the team will get the casualty ready for transport using the tarp stretcher approach. This will cause less movement of the casualty to reduce risk of blood loss. Normally, moving the casualty is not advised, but because emergency service is busy with the rest of the earthquake and the casualty needs medical attention, this is an exception. Now moving to the second casualty. Once again, the first aid team will assess the risks of the environment to the site, looking for a loose foundation that could fall. It's important to keep a calm approach and not run into first aid scenarios. When approaching any first aid scenario and the first aider runs or rushes, it causes their body to increase adrenaline production, which can increase the risk of hasty decisions. The team will the team will again do a 30 second head to toe assessment and find that the casualty has a lung injury and eye injury. The team will focus on the lung injury first. Creating a seal so that the lung can still semi function is important. The team uses a plastic covering to seal the wound so that the lungs can still semi function by bringing air in the nose. One side of the covering will stay open. This will help drain the blood so that the blood doesn't fill into the lung. Our lungs breathe using a concept called negative airspace, which means our lungs expand using muscles around them sucking in air. According to lung.org, our lungs on average hold three large side bottles or six liters of air. That's impressive. The team will now work on the eye injury. With first aid, the important rule of thumb is if something is stabbed in, don't take it out. You can cause more damage by doing so. So the team will put support around the eye and cover both. 
This decreases movement of the eyes and thus decreases damage. Now the team will prepare for transport using the chairlift technique. This concludes our first aid scenario. Our team did an amazing job bringing these individuals to safety. Although, there is another earthquake warning, so the team will now carry these individuals away. Thank you. The parade will now be returning for the remainder of the ceremony. At this time, I would like to call on our reviewing officer, the commanding officer of the Regional Cadet Support Unit, Pacific, Commander Paula McHale, to say a few words. Good afternoon, uh, distinguished guests. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Corey Mask, the CEO of the Tactical Fighter uh, Unit Squadron uh, 409 Nighthawk in Cold Lake. Parents, families, league partners, community members, cadet supporters, CIC Coats team, counselors from Penticton, Legion representatives, and most importantly, cadets. It's my Pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. Ça me fait très très content d'être ici avec vous aujourd'hui. It's amazing how many supporters there are in the fans. Like I'm so delighted that all these people came to watch, watch you um, do the capstone of your year. Well done to all of you. It's been a treat to observe how you spend your first full year back since the pandemic. Especially, it's moving to see you join together, cadets from 258, sorry, 259 Panther, 902 Nighthawk, 232 Bighorn, and 788 BC Dragoons. Chief Warrant Officer Thomas and I can see how much work and heart you've put into this year through this parade today. I especially want to take note of the band and cadet Bakshi who sang O Canada. That takes a lot of courage and it was so impressive. Thank you very much. Maybe we can give her a round of applause. Okay. So like you, I was a cadet, a sea cadet from Nanaimo, BC. And there are countless examples of times where as a team, things didn't go according to plan and we adapted. 
It could have been the result of a changed timing, or an unserviceable piece of equipment, or the absence of a teammate. Through mutual creativity, we found ways to proceed. This was our usual approach to challenges. And I was asked today to talk to you about adaptability, overcoming adversity, and working together. So these are like three strands, you know, that you could weave together in a braid, and you could call the braid resilience. So when I was a cadet, we did have challenges as well, but your cadet experience has been very different from mine. You've had to deal with the unexpected in a way that I and those of my generations did not have to. Your plans and goals had to be altered. You had to pivot and persevere. The pandemic forced you to reframe your entire cadet experience, which was actually one of its gifts. While elements of this were stressful and challenging, you learned new ways to lead and grow and ways to be together. All the cadets assembled here today have proven that they can rise to new challenges. This is a valuable life skill that you have in your toolbox, something to rely on as you journey to independence and adulthood. This resilience is what will make you better able to adapt when change happens. And change always happens. It's the ability to withstand adversity and bounce back from difficult life events. It's a habit, a mindset, and you get to decide to practice it. As leaders, it's an essential skill and you can exercise it just like a muscle and make it stronger. When faced with change, people react in different ways. There is a principle in neuroscience called the free energy principle. This means that our brains seek to minimize surprise as a way of conserving valuable energy. What's the best way to minimize surprise? Well, to expect it, to plan it, even to seek it. And this is what courageous leaders like all of you do. This morning on Simon Sinek's Instagram, there was a quote, those with a finite mindset fear surprises. Those with an infinite mindset see opportunity in the unexpected. I shared it to my Instagram story if you want to find it later. For the most common fear that relates to change is a fear of becoming irrelevant. It takes courage to stretch outside of one's comfort zone, try new things, join a cadet squadron if you're new, but this fear is misguided. As it turns out, evolution is necessary to stay relevant. If you don't agree, you can ask the Tasmanian tiger, the dodo, the woolly mammoth, or the Labrador duck. Unfortunately, they're all extinct. Charles Darwin, when pioneering the theory of evolution, said, it's not the strongest of a species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the, mo the ones most resilient and responsive to change. We build resilience into ourselves and into others that we care about. Adam Grant, a popular organizational psychologist and author, describes building resilience together as a community as being called collective resilience. And that is what you are doing here today. You're building collective resilience. By coming together as a larger community, cadets from Oliver, Penticton, and Summerland, all at once, all together. All these cadets who have grown through COVID experience are experts in rolling with the punches and leading it. And your example is an inspiration to us all. I'm talking about us all adults here. As humans, we need our communities, our teams, our cores, our squadrons to depend on when things change. This is for support, for someone to lean on, and most importantly, for friendship. Despite all the trimmings here, the gleaming polish, polish the smart uniforms, the, the sharp drill, the flags, and the formality of today's events, we all take part in this terrific program for one reason, to enjoy one another's company. The cadet community and its culture is defined by our shared stories and narratives, and new, story, new stories in Penticton are being made here today. Stories of resilient cadets, adaptable and courageous, growing the program back better collectively. Félicitations, merci d'avoir m'accueilli si chaleureusement cet après-midi, and congratulations on a successful year. Thank you for inviting me and Chief Thomas. It has been a great joy to share this beautiful afternoon with you. Thanks. Thank you, Commander McHale.
Now, now I'd like to introduce Lieutenant Colonel Corey Mask, the CEO of 902's affiliated squadron, 409 Nighthawks Tactical Fighter Squadron. Lieutenant Colonel Corey Alkin Mask grew up in Orleans and served in the Canadian Armed Forces. In total, Lieutenant Colonel Mask had over 2,000 hours of military flight time. Without further ado, please welcome Lieutenant Colonel Mask. Awesome. Uh, first off, uh, to all the cadets, go ahead, stand easy, shake it out. Just, you know, there's a lot of time spending standing at attention or at ease. It's all good. There you go. Whatever works for comfortable. This kind of looks a little awkward for some of you guys, so do go ahead and like take a seat if you want. It's max relax here. I'm not going to take too much of your time, but I want you all to be uh, comfortable. And the main thing is that you guys are, are sorted. So before I start here, I'll go a little off script, but for every one of you out there, just take a look out back here. They're all here to see you today, right? I'm here to say a few things, but it's all about yourselves there. So the common themes of everything that you're gonna hear us talk to are kind of tips and techniques for yourselves going forward, but what you should be most proud of for yourselves here is that you're here and this impressive audience is here for you. So for the audience, I'd like you to please give these guys and girls a round of applause. <laughs> Commander McHale, Chief Thomas, uh, Cadet, commanding officers, all the cadets on parade, assembled guests, family, friends in front of me, well, I'm behind me. Um, it's with great pleasure that I can be this, the special guest today. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. So my sincere thanks to Captain Brown and the 902 Nighthawks for inviting me this, uh, this afternoon. This is actually one of my first, and now it'll be my last chances to travel to actually go talk to people as I'm retiring after 25 years. Uh, but it's a great honor and privilege to be here and to meet you all today. Um, I chose this fact as a bit of a theme, and apparently we have the same speechwriters because it's, it's common, common traits, right? However, take it as, as they're important, right? And uh, for that. so. For me, my retirement and the end of my tour as a CO at 409 Squadrons, it, it's an end and it's a new beginning. Your annual ceremonial review, it's an end and it's a new beginning. And that just flows through with life. Uh, and there's, before you know it, something ends, it's time to move forward again. And there's a lot of time for you to reflect and actually grow from it. If you take the time to think back and be like, wow, that was awesome. Or even sometimes, hey, that wasn't so awesome. But you know what? You can learn from it and move forward. So I have a few areas that I'd love for you to take away to just try and be able to, to, to help live in those moments, embrace change, and grow. For myself, every day as a fighter squadron commanding officer and also as someone trying to, to do the best of what they can each day at a time. It's, you know, I have my own personal philosophy of enabling uh, things. So the three main components that I find are most critical are effective two-way communication, the ability to actually communicate. You need a team or a group of people that are resilient, able to react to change, respond to change. And then you need to remember that you always need to remember your supporters. So communicating is tough on a good day and effective two-way communication is even tougher. It's one of the most important things to take away from this fact, one that I see almost every day, is that not everyone views or sees the world or experiences the same situation through the same lens, and that's okay. The art of communication is much more than being a one-way stream of information because what you mean or what you intend is easily misinterpreted or misunderstood by someone else. Breakdowns in friendships, relationships, 
and conflicts are all rooted in a breakdown in that basic of communication. And I've learned through experience that in every situation you have, it's important to take the time to make the effort to try and connect or find that connection to the topic or the person that you're not only hearing, that you're also listening as well. There's a quote that I saw recently that perfectly sums it up, and it was actually a wise man, Sir Winston Churchill, who said it. Um, Courage is what it takes to stand up and speak. Courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. So free your mind of all those intrinsic biases and what you think is necessarily right at first glance, and be open to yourself for the other, the other points of view. And just think of that, simple words yet powerful. Don't be afraid to talk people, right? Move away from rapid fire text messages. Don't text when you're angry. Don't, don't email when you're angry. Take a break, right? Kind of look at that other side and be like, hmm, okay, I never thought of it that way. Generally, we're all reasonable people and really most often you mean well. So, you know, sometimes a point can be easily lost when you jump to what is supposed to happen. So two-way communication helps us grow and learn. With respect to adversity, resiliency, Commander McHale uh, mentioned most of them, but the fact that you're here today is, is, is a key point, right? It may be taken for granted that you're all on parade, but you know, given what has happened over the last three years, makes it a great example of overcoming adversity. When Captain Brown reached out to me when I first took over in 2020, uh, 2021, there were only a handful of cadets at 902, and now there's over 30, right? That's, that's awesome. That is the prime example of overcoming adversity. Facing challenges head on, identifying obstacles, you know, seeking solutions are all aspects and things that you're gonna face through your entire lives. So taking the hits and learning from them, bouncing back with a smile, that's exactly the things that will set you up for success and the things that you're learning here with cadets. Remember, you don't have to always find a solution or the answers. Key thing is identify those obstacles and, and communicate them, right? That's that bridge of the gap of the communication. And then to the last piece um, about being a part of a team. The concepts of working as a team, realizing you can't go through things alone and the sum is greater than the individual parts resonates all through society and you're all demonstrating it today. Like I said earlier, you know, it's easy to slough things off, but being a part of the team really does require hard work and makes the successes or overcoming those challenges even more satisfying. Being dedicated to something, seeing things through in good times and through adversity those are essential traits that will help you succeed and stand out in a crowd. Even Hollywood loves these types of stories. They made the two best, greatest movies, Top Gun and Top Gun Maverick, that were based upon that. But really, the thing to remember when you look out and see everyone there is rarely anything is achieved in life alone. Everyone needs support. It's these type of occasion where you realize the power of having a mass of supporters, and they're a team too. I've had the privilege to learn and be shaped from countless mentors and supporters, and I've benefited from all of them. And I remind everyone to never miss a chance to become a mentor, a teacher, a lifeline in any situation you face. And more importantly, when you see one of those people who have made a difference, go ahead and say, you know what, thank you, that really helped. It works both ways. We all have a, play, a role to play in making everyone better and as we move forward, those small little things you never even considered as important collectively make a much greater impact. None of this is possible though without your greatest supporters, your family. Life is wonderful, tough, and you never know what detour or journey is gonna lie ahead. And a strong family, which has no real standard definition, is there to celebrate your successes, pick you up when you need it, or pick, up, pick you up in those most critical times when you didn't even know that you needed, needed it. Because it feels like they're always there, sometimes it's easy to forget that fact, but your own version of family is your first team that you enter and the last one you leave. So take the time to support and continuously build that critical component. 
So in closing, I want you to all remember that this parade is much more than just the last ceremonial review of the year. It's a new beginning. So reflect on what you've learned and experienced and gained and run with it. Grow with it and allow others to benefit. Your dedication, leadership, citizenship, they all have direct links with the cadet mission and vision and are great foundations for setting you up for success. You have the world ahead of you and it goes by very, very fast. So take ownership, be accountable, take advantage of those opportunities, be humble, and never stop learning, communicating, or lose that determination for constant improvement. I learn and grow from myself by just interacting and talking to you all, and I hope that some of what I said can help you grow and learn too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Mask. I will now ask our Air Cadet League representative, Mrs. Student Susan Midgley, League representative, Air Cadet League of Canada, British Columbia Provincial Committee, to give us a speech. Please join me in welcoming her to the podium. Good afternoon, Commander McAllen and Lieutenant Colonel Mack, all of the other dignitaries, including sponsoring committees, officers, parents, <coughs> guests, and cadets. It's an honor for me to be the representative for the BC Provincial Committee Air, of the Air Cadet League of Canada for your annual ceremonial re review. <clears throat> it's a, um, sorry. It's a pleasure for me to be here to witness how our cadets in the Okanagan have been thriving and indeed growing. Um, the program is a success due to the partnership between the Department of National Defense, the officers of the Pacific Region Cadet U Support Unit, and the support of the Air Cadet League of Canada and the sponsoring committees. Many hours of work are dedicated by the officers, civilian instructors, volunteers, and parents. And of course, the reason we're here today, the cadets. These young people before us are our investment in the future and are the future leaders of Canada. Your wonderful presentations today have shown that you have had a very busy and successful year. I have enjoyed the performances by your squadron and I'm looking forward to seeing your static displays outside. To the cadets, congratulations on a successful year. Well done. On behalf of Mr. Norman Scott, President and the members of the BC Provincial Committee of the Air Cadet League of Canada, I wish you all a great summer, have a good time at your camps, and continued success with the Air Cadet program. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Midgley. 
I would now like to call on the representative for the chairs of the Corps and Squadron Sponsoring Committee to say a few words. The chair of the 902 Sponsoring Committee, Adele Meadow. Please welcome her to the podium. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I just want to say, first of all, how very, very proud we are of all the cadets. It's just such a pleasure to see you, um, the culmination of a year of hard work, to see you show up week in, week out, uh, dedicate yourselves to the program. You truly are um, a delight to behold, and you should be very, very proud of yourselves. I want to say thank you to everybody who's been involved in putting together the ACR today. It takes a lot of work and a team of people, um, officers, parent volunteers, the dignitaries who have um, given their time to be here today. So thank you so much for everybody who has, has put this day together. Um, it takes a lot to run a squadron. Um, it takes a lot of support and that's where the squadron sponsoring committees come in. It's our role to be there to support the officers, um, to help the program to run as successfully as it does. So I would encourage all parents, family members, anybody who has an interest in the program to reach out to your sponsoring committee, um, get involved, take the time to, to put the work into to support our squadrons because if we don't support them, they won't thrive the way that they are. And they have thrived in the past few years. They've, They've shown the resilience that the, uh, the dignitaries have spoken of, and I'm so very proud of that. And I really want to, to give back to them and to pour our time and energy into making them the successful leaders of the future that they're definitely going to be. So thank you so much for, for being here today. And again, we're just so very proud of you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Meadow. Captain Guzan, the, com the commanding officer of 259 Pan Penticton RCACS, will now address the parade on behalf of the COs of the units participating today. Good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, up here today. Sorry. I am up here today representing all of the COs for the South Okanagan. Probably because I am the worst player of um, rock, paper, scissors ever because I was the one who flipped the coin and, and lost, apparently. But I also get to say how proud I am of every single cadet that is on parade here today. While I am also proud of the cadets that are here today, I am very proud of the parents behind me who have supported these cadets all year long, gotten them to their, their, uh, their activities, some of them have uh, kicked them out to come to cadets and have also helped us in many taskings such as getting to the, the cadets to uh, the air, the gliding, the fan flying, to biathlon, to range. Without your parents, we wouldn't have a cadet program either because many of your parents have also been cadets. Or, they have opted to send you guys or follow you and support you in your endeavor with cadets. Someone else that we also have to thank is our sponsoring committees, which, for the most part, is made up of your parents. I'd like to th thank the sponsoring committees for joining so well today in making this a success. Without your help and your backing, this would not have happened. We also have to note our dignitaries and our sponsors throughout the Okanagan who have 
supported us either financially or with their time. Several of them are listed at the back of our program today. I will not list them all, but I would like them all who are representing here today to know that we appreciate all of the support that you have given us throughout the years, and especially recently coming out of COVID. I know that it has not been easy for us to step forward, and you guys have made it and ex helped us excel with this program to bring it back to life in the last year. As COs, we would also like to thank our officers and our civilian volunteers and instructors. Without you, we would not have the time nor the training to give to these cadets who are standing so proudly in front of you today. Thank you very much. I'd like to say a very special thank you to the 259 officers who took on double duty this year to make sure that 788, which, as some of you may not know, is the oldest cadet unit in the o South Okanagan. They helped us so that it would not fold. And from two cadets at the beginning of the year, we are now looking at 10 cadets to finish the end of the year. We are going to continue to bring 788 back up, and hopefully by the end of next year, they will be parading on their own but we will always, always be working together to make sure that we can continue to work together. The collaboration that we have seen this year to make sure that these cadets here are able to attend events that otherwise they would not have been able to, such as range. We had 902, 788, and 259 working together with one range officer from one unit. This would not have been possible if, the, if we would not have collaborated. The ACR today would not have been as successful today if we would not have collaborated with all four units. I personally am looking forward to working more with all four units to show that the South Okanagan has a strong and true cadet personality and resilience. But most of all, I would like to say thank you once again to the cadets here today. Those who will be aging out, good luck in your endeavors. You made us proud. You kept this thing alive. Many of you did not have the opportunity to parade until this year. You came up from juniors and took on leadership positions that you had no idea how they were run because there was nobody to pass it on to you because we were so virtual for th almost three years. And you stepped into those positions and you did them well. So on behalf of the COs of 259, 902, 788, and 232, we would like to congratulate the cadets, their parents, our sponsors, our dignitaries, and the officers for a job well done. Thank you for keeping the cadet program in the Okanagan, in the Okanagan alive and well. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Goosen. Now for the awards and recognitions. I would like to call on our Air Cadet League, Mrs. Susan Midgley, for a League Representative, Air Cadet League of Canada, British Columbia Provincial Committee, for a special presentation. Could I please call the commanding officer of 259 up and also the sponsoring committee chair? of the Air Cadet League of Canada and the British Columbia Provincial, whatever, <laughs> <laughs> I
I'd like to congratulate you on 80 years of Air Cadet Program. Thanks, you guys. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> we now move on to present the Lord Strathcona Medal. The Lord Strathcona Medal is granted in recognition of a high performance in physical and military training. The Strathcoma Trust Provincial Committee awards one medal and a certificate of merit to one deserving cadet in each of the course or squadron annually. The cadets selected for this award must have a wide range of experience in the activities of the cadet movement and as well have attended at least 75% of the squadron local training, participated in squadron outings, weekend exercises, and cultural visits, preferably attended at least one national or regional summer camp, participated in a squadron citizenship project, demonstrated a high degree of physical fitness, and attain a high standard of proficiency in qualifying to a training level, which is not below level three. I would like to call on our reviewing officer, CEO of the RCSU Pacific, Commander Paula McHale to present the Lord Strathcona Medal to 788's Corporal Caleb McIntosh. Commander Paula McHale will now present the Lord Strathcona Medal to 232's Flight Sergeant Inuk Samard. Commander, Commander Paula McHale will now present the Lord Strathcona Medal virtually to a cadet who is currently competing in Ontario at a national BMX competition. 259's Flight Sergeant Marquez Gonzalez. Gonzalez. Thank you, Commander Paula McHale. I would now like to call on the CO of 902's affiliated unit, 409 Tactical Fighter Squadron, RCAF, Lieutenant Colonel Corey Mask, to present the Lord Strathcona Medal to 902's
Flight Sergeant Samuel Franson. The Royal Canadian Legion Cadet Medal of Excellence recognizes individual endeavors of a citizenship nature which have met or enhanced the aims objective of the cadet organization. A cadet must have annually completed the following milestones in each of three years in the cadet's training. A. Met all the requirements of the Corps or Squadron Local Headquarters Annual Mandatory Training Program. B. Met all the requirements of the Corps and Squadron L LHQ support and optional training program. C. Participated in a minimum of three community service events in addition to those supported by the cadet unit through its L LHQ program. D. Regarded by peers and superiors accentuating the model cadet and enhanced the the cadet unit through cooperation with peers and subordinates, team spirit, promoting goodwill and morale within corps and squadron, aiding in development of group identity and cohesiveness, supporting and assisting fellow unit members, and enhancing the impact of the cadet organization in the local community. These medals are presented by an individual legion branch branches who sponsor or support the individual squadrons. I would like to call on the Royal Canadian Legion Branch representatives, President Jim D. Mark DeMars, Pre Branch 40, Penticton Legion, Acting President Dale Young, Branch 97, Oliver Legion, Cadet Layson, Ron ba Bannister, Branch 40, Penticton Legion, Vice President Bill Jennings, Branch 227, Oak okay Falls. They will present the Legion Medal of Excellence to 788's Warrant Officer Gabriel Maskey, 232's Flight Sergeant Alex Hunker, 259's Warrant Officer Second Class Callum Thompson, and, and 902's Sergeant Aiden Meadows.
Thank you to all the Legion members, as well as the recipients. I would now like to call up 232 Bighorn Squadron's CO, Amy Nectel, to present Warrant Officer First Class Connor Mackey with a shadow box for aging out. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the presentations, awards, and speeches. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the advance in review order, God Save the King, and departure of the reviewing officer. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the parade portion of our program. Our final presentations are static displays demonstrating the cadet program and training received over the year. The displays are located in the foyer of the building. It is strongly encouraged that everybody views and displays, as previously noted, the summary of activities the cadets have participated in 
or what the cadet program has to offer. You may also join us in the foyer for the cutting of a cake and refreshments. Thank you for attending the 83rd Annual Ceremonial Review of the 788 British Columbia Dragoon, Dragoons RCACC, the 81st Annual Ceremonial Review of the 232 Bighorn RCACS, the 81st Annual Ceremonial Review of the 259 Panther RCACS, and the 31st Annual Ceremonial Review of the 902 Nighthawk RCACS. Thank you so much for being here with us today to celebrate. You may now be seated. Yeah.